And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the intersection where faith and reason intersect. I'm Doug Keck, the gatekeeper here at uh, Mother Angelica Way, at the mothership where it all began, thanks to our wonderful foundress. You can email your questions to us at spitzersuniverse at ew10.com. Check out all of Father Spitzer's websites. There's three of them, the Magis Center one and the Purposeful Universe one and the SpitzerCenter.org, which we put on the screen on and off during the program. And of course, Father Spitzer's Universe is always available on our YouTube channel and on our EW10 On Demand channel. And you can also find plenty of family-friendly programming from your children as well. Your kids have fun while learning about the faith with Tompkin, the Roman Catholic also, uh, the Friar. And again, all these programs we have are for free and on demand and perfectly appropriate any of our kids programming for your children at virtually any age so uh, it's important to start young today we'll be answering viewer questions from our mailbag our email bag that is and of course with that we'll turn to the answer man himself mr universe <laughs> father spitzer who will join us uh, who i'm I, is, I hope that brain's cooking there father because we got a lot of questions for you Oh boy, yeah, I think uh, it's on overdrive right now. Okay, so. there you go. I got you. I got you up to up to speed here. So with that, if you kick off everything uh, with a prayer. You bet. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us. The blessing, especially of this ministry and our ability to serve in it. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us now to inspire, guide, and protect us so that everything we do will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask you, too, to bless Doug, myself, our whole staff, our uh, audience this day, too, with that same spirit. And please, Lord, uh, bring all that we do to fruition in your will, especially our Lenten sacrifices, mm. through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to take uh, some questions here. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, sure. I'm struggling to understand why we cannot help ourselves when we're in purgatory. After we die, why can't we continue to pray for ourselves and let go of attachments and mental disorders if we're still able to pray for those who are still alive? Do we need our physical bodies to help ourselves? That's the question, James. Well, James, no, I've never heard that you can't help yourself. Uh, half of what mm -hmm. purgatory is about is helping yourself because you know, it, when you try to improve and to go through this, uh, you know, purification that's part of the uh, program in purgatory, the, the whole idea is that you're freely uh, participating mm -hmm. in it. So whoever told you you can't do anything for yourself, I, I don't know where that came from. I don't think it came from the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. uh, from anywhere I know. So uh, you're uh, definitely uh, going to be doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you can pray for yourself. You can pray for others. You can also uh, definitely, as you're going through the purification process, willingly participate in it and cooperate with it and come closer to God, which is what the whole purification or purgation process is about. Mm -hmm. So uh, please uh, go ahead and do that. And whoever indicated that you couldn't, uh, I don't know where that came right. from, but it's not an official doctrine of the church. Maybe it's, uh, you know, borderlining on the hell, you know, where some people had a view of purgatory where it was more like the Ante room of hell than necessarily the ante room of heaven, and oh, oh. obviously you can't save yourself yeah. once you're in hell. So maybe there's some uh, some yeah. kind of confusion there. Next up, dear Father Spitzer, yeah, and maybe because maybe so. of the fact that there's so much emphasis on praying for those people and that they need our prayers, the impression is, uh, is yeah, that if that's we probably you know, maybe yeah. they can't do it themselves. But obviously, we all need help, and prayer is a wonderful thing. And, and it doesn't just do something for the people you're praying for. It helps you greatly, the fact that you're praying. Anyway. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Dear Father Spitzer, over the past few years, I have developed a loving relationship with Jesus, treating him as a close familial friend to whom I confide everything. Uh, worries, uh, requests, gratitude. However, I come to across a good Catholic sources that imply I should instead approach our Lord in fear and trembling, kneeling, eyes averted in awe of his majesty. Okay. 
Is my familiarity with him disrespectful to his position as my Lord and Creator? Right now, I feel I might have deeply offended him, assuming a closeness I have no right to enjoy. Joyce, I certainly hope not. <laughs> No, Joyce, I mean, your relationship is just like my relationship. I'm very familiar with the Lord. I, I, can, I tell him all that's on my mind. Uh, he actually puts up with me very patiently indeed. And, of course, uh, you know, I'm awed by his majesty. Mm -hmm. But remember, fear and trembling, that's a, you know, you have to be careful that word mm -hmm. fear because there's 20 words in Hebrew mm -hmm. for fear. The ones that are used with respect to the fear of God are awe, right, of mm -hmm. being awe-inspired, of being, you know, filled with worship and mm -hmm. filled with reverence. I mean, that's the kind of fear that's being talked about right. there. The idea of counterpoising, you know, that with familiarity is definitely contrary to the whole Catholic spiritual life. I mean, St. Benedict, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, what's the point of prayer, she says? To have a loving conversation with God. So, I mean, you're, uh, um, you're uh, right. absolutely on the right well, track, Joyce. You're doing all the right things. Do not deviate. And whatever right. source was recommending that you uh, turn it into fear and trembling, please uh, right. put that one aside. I don't think anybody, especially in the Catholic Church, needs that one because it certainly doesn't uh, coincide with anything I've heard from right. Ignatius of Loyola all the way to, uh, um, to uh, right. Teresa of Avila and way beyond that as well. So uh, very much out of step with Catholic Right, our Lord said to his uh, disciples, I, I call you friends, right? I mm -hmm. mean, that's, uh, that was the relationship he had yes. with them as part of it. And, and the other thing I heard course. someone talking about it, and it's Beloved. probably, right, exactly, what, yeah. you know, a translation, but yeah. th they were talking about the fear as well, being the idea that, uh, that this fear, I, I don't wanna, I love the Lord so much, I don't wanna let him down. I'm afraid I'm gonna let him down. And that's well, their version that's of kind of looking at it that's very different. Too. Yeah. 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 That's you know, fear of letting the Lord down, down instead right. of fear of God. Right, right exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. I just thought that was an yeah. interesting mm -hmm. way of thinking about it as well. may not be yeah. biblically, uh, yeah. you know, from the language as you indicated, but, but it, it, it's in the yeah. same kind of ballpark. Dear Father Spitzer, how does one discern yeah. if our thoughts are simply our thoughts or God speaking to us through the Holy Spirit? And this is Dana. Uh, that's a good one because uh, an old friend yeah. of mine Years ago, when Marriage Encounter said there's been more dis bad decisions blamed on the Holy Spirit than anybody else. So I always remember that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, Dana, you know, there are, you know, some times when um, you pretty much can tell, you know, that this is something you've been thinking about and, and so forth. But there are also times, and I have to say, you know, when I'll be speaking about something or saying something to mm -hmm. somebody and... I just have this insight that just I haven't been thinking about at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ignatius calls it a kind of an insight or a consolation without previous cause. Mm -hmm. And what he means by that is, you know, you haven't been thinking about it and it's a completely creative thing and it just comes to you at the spur of the moment mm -hmm. when you really need it. I generally, if I reflect back on it, and I really can authentically say, well, my subconscious is not that smart. Right. And I'm, you know, my, my regular intelligence is not that smart. Generally, I figure that's the Holy Spirit inspiring me. And, um, you know, that's true. And, of course, if something right. is markedly stupid, I know it comes from me. Mm -hmm. If something right. is really, uh, uh, you know, good and beyond me, I know it comes from the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, I, I shouldn't say that everything I think is markedly right. stupid, but, you know, if, if, I, if I see something that I'm saying that, uh, you know, turns out mm -hmm. to be a falsity, I'm certainly not going to attribute it to the Holy Spirit. Right. So, um, you know, I, I think you're right, though, Dana, you should be very careful about attributing things uh, to the Holy Spirit when you're not sure. But if you've got, you know, something, uh, you know, happens, mm -hmm. you come up with a creative insight, you can see it's consistent with the teaching of Jesus, and you can see that it was just at the right moment when it mm -hmm. was needed, and you hadn't been thinking about right. it before. Like, the Holy Spirit is a likely, right. uh, uh, um, you know, right. uh, active voice, right. as it were, uh, that may be and inspiring as, you at that and moment. And as, as you said on the show many times, you know, if it brings you closer in your relationship to God, then you know maybe yep. it's the Holy Spirit. If it's taking you away, then oh, yeah. it's probably not the Holy Spirit, right? 
another so, spirit. Yeah, right, absolutely. Exactly. All right. Dear mm -hmm. Father Spitzer, yeah. I read an article that said it was impossible for a Christian to be possessed by the devil. The reason given was that according to Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit dwells within us, and he would surely not allow the devil to dwell in the same place. But since Christians, like everyone else, have free will, can they not invite the devil in by trying to communicate with spirits or some other method? What are your thoughts, Pat? Well, Paul, I have to tell you, that um, <clears throat> you're smarter than the article you were reading mm -hmm. because uh, the article uh, clearly is disputed by not only uh, Catholic doctrine, uh, but if you have ever been at a deliverance ministry or an exorcism, you will know uh, that uh, absolutely a Christian who has been baptized uh, can be possessed and you've got the exact reason for it. Mm -hmm. You can freely invite the devil into you and you can uh, do that by a variety of means, uh, you know, uh, putting yourself uh, into a Satanist ceremony is a great way to start, trying to curse another person mm -hmm. so that a spell or some power curse will come. I mean, you're the first recipient of the curse whenever you invoke a curse, which is through, of course, if you're cursing is through the devil whenever you invoke that it goes right back to you first right. or when you play with a Ouija board or something of that nature uh, generally if you open yourself up to the to the evil spirit he'll come and of course it doesn't have to necessarily be a ritual way of of doing that you can actually do that uh, by your actions and just kind of go down this road of perdition you know into a darker and darker and darker mm -hmm. place where all of a sudden you know uh, you know, the thin line between you and the evil spirit is just finally breached mm -hmm. uh, because you're so used to being there. And, of course, he takes where he can take possession, where he can get his power, he'll do it mm -hmm. unless he somehow thinks that this will be contrary to his purpose. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, you're right on the marker. So I think, explain uh, that. Uh, explain that. You said mm -hmm. unless he feels it would be contrary to his purpose. What do you mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes the devil doesn't want anybody to know he's around. Okay. So, you know, he, he may take possession of a person, but he'll be on the low level. Mm. Or sometimes he will choose to oppress a person and not possess a person because he prefers to remain hidden. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, anybody who invites the evil spirit in, uh, you can expect he'll go as far as he can possibly go as quickly as he can mm. because that's his purpose. He... He, his whole purpose is to, uh, right. you know, basically control you uh, to the extent that he can. And uh, a possession right. can never take away your free will. <clears throat> so he can't control you that way. But he certainly can manifest through your body mm -hmm. and through your um, imagination a whole set of behaviors mm -hmm. uh, that uh, would clearly, uh, you know, not be you, but would be him right. manifesting himself through what appears to be you. Right. Well, let me ask you. Uh, so we know in Scripture uh, with the, uh, uh, the demoniac, it's, uh, you know, we are legion. Okay. So obviously uh -huh. there, there was more than one. Yeah. And then we talk about being possessed by the devil. Yeah. So it, it, uh, how do you know it, between it's, uh, if, if it's one demon or multiple demons or it's the devil or does it matter? Yeah, well, Satan is behind all of them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, basically, if you just say, in the name of Jesus, be gone, Satan, and I've recommended this prayer many, many times, uh, if you say that about five, six, seven times, hmm. man, you can uh, cause temptation to subside. You can, um, you know, if, if, especially if you feel mm -hmm. that someone is, you know, um, kind of like an evil spirit is, is pushing you or trying, attempting to not just tempt you, but uh, uh, to cause you some form of anxiety or nightmare, uh, just to just take out that prayer. He simply hates the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, the devil does, so you can, or Satan does. Mm -hmm. So you can just go, you know, get behind me, uh, Satan. You know, in the name of Jesus, yeah. you know, be gone, Satan. And so Satan's always there. Mm -hmm. And even if it's his minions or it's hundreds of his minions, He's always in the backdrop. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're, you know, doing an exorcism, it is important uh, to know the name of the demon because by knowing the name, 
you have a certain kind of control over him in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, the name of Jesus dominates over his name. And so you'll notice that the exorcist does try to ascertain the name, um, you know, of the, uh, of the, of the demon. And so uh, that's uh, very typical. Why would he then, give it uh, out? If it, oh, uh, because he can't help well, himself? Well, because the name of Jesus, for, uh, no, he can't help himself okay. in the name. If you're invoking the name of Jesus and you do it, uh, you know, often mm -hmm. enough, eventually you can command him in the name of Jesus to give uh, his name and I he see. will do it. Okay. I mean, uh, yes, and, and it, it certainly, d it may take a while, but he will do mm -hmm. it. Okay. And, um, you know, that's uh, very, very typical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, next up, dear Father Spitzer, I recently converted to the Catholic faith and I'm having difficulty with my devotion to Mary. In the Hail Mary, we ask her to pray for us in our hour of need, quote, end quote. How is it that she knows when that will be for each person on earth? Is she omniscient? And if she is, when did she attain that exalted state? Please explain Daniel. Well, I'm not sure. Okay, hey, Daniel, uh, real, two quick things here uh, for you. First of all, of course, um, Mary's not omniscient. Only God is omniscient. And there's a very good philosophical and theological reason uh, for that. And, and, of course, it's a theological uh, teaching of the Catholic mm -hmm. Church. However, Mary does share mm -hmm. in what we might call the vision of God, right? So um, uh, because of Mary's exalted status, which she had, right, at the very moment of her assumption, <coughs> she's exalted into heaven at that very moment. She's sharing in the vision of God. Mm -hmm. She's sharing in the exalted vision. So she sees in many ways what God sees through his power, mm -hmm. though she does not possess the power herself. So she's not, you know, pu uh, pu you know deified, if mm -hmm. I can put it that way, uh, but she is exalted, mm -hmm. and that exaltation certainly allows her to know what, you know, trillions, uh, not trillions, but billions of people are thinking around mm -hmm. the world, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the same time, and of course, uh, she can handle it because her mind is elevated, uh, as it were, her vision is elevated to that of her sons mm -hmm. uh, in the exaltation. So, I mean, basically, you know, you share in a vision for mm -hmm. Mary, whereas with uh, Jesus, it belongs to him by nature. Okay, very good. Next up, dear Father Spitzer, yep. if it's so important we believe in God, why doesn't he make it more obvious for us to believe in him? Stephanie. Stephanie, very good reason. You're free, mm -hmm. and God is never going to do anything to interfere with your freedom. So if he reveals himself and reveals himself in his all-powerful nature as he really is, uh, all of a sudden, you know, can that take away your freedom? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's like uh, the Three Stooges cartoon, you know, when mm -hmm. the brute comes, uh, you know, uh, and, and says, hey, you're you going to do what I want? Oh, sure. Okay. You know, and, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, you're not going to argue with a person, you know, that has that kind of power, mm -hmm. which is obvious to you at the time. So God always has to be very subtle, mm -hmm. not just subtle in, in, you know, the revealing of himself, but even subtle in the ways he can protect you so that he's not going to take away your freedom. He's not going to make the decision, as it were, for you or give you so much knowledge that, you know, you will not have your own force of will. You will be compelled by the knowledge that you have of what mm -hmm. the full consequences would be. And so, uh, for all intents and purposes, mm -hmm. God has to allow you to be free. That's the whole point of this life on earth which is why it's so necessary for the evil spirit, uh, it, going back to the previous question, why the evil spirit has to wait because, of course, he has no choice, as it were, mm -hmm. because you have a choice. Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> if you give him permission, he'll be there. But yeah. until you do, he can do nothing. And if you go to confession, you start going to Holy Communion, etc. You protect yourself from mm -hmm. him. He can't come in. He can't uh, uh, get through that defense. But just to be a Christian is not enough. Mm -hmm. You have to be a practicing Christian. Of course, the sacraments are exceedingly important. And on top of that, uh, the, especially the sacraments of uh, confession and, of course, the Holy Eucharist itself 
and that's that's your protection. Right. I mean, that's mm -hmm. basically he can't burst through it if you're sincere uh, in your faith commitment. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Next up, uh, dear Father Spitzer, I'm a former Lutheran. The minister at my Lutheran church was previously an ordained Catholic priest who then left the priesthood. As I understand, wow. when a when a man is ordained as a Catholic priest, he is ontologically changed and a priest forever. Was I receiving the real body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus in my Lutheran church? Marcia. Well, Marcia, um, boy, uh, you know, first of all, he is an ontological uh, priest forever. But uh, there's a difference, right? So in other words, when, uh, even though this is an, uh, you know, a, a Catholic, a former Catholic priest, you have to have a charge, a munio. So you, you have to have, <clears throat> you know, a charge from the church, a, a task that's given and mandated and mm -hmm. authorized by the church in order for you to be consecrating a host, right? So that, you know, the host becomes the real body and blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. If you don't have such a charge or you have separated yourself from the very authority that can give you that charge, it's no longer the real presence, right? It's not the real body, blood soul and divinity of Christ mm -hmm. because of course he uh, has now made himself uh, you know separated from that authority source and so he can't receive the charge which is necessary for him to validly consecrate the sacrament etc uh, etc so um, you did mm -hmm. not receive the real body and blood uh, from, of Christ from him but it's a really good question mm -hmm. <clears throat> because as you put it the dilemma is is he a priest well yes he's still a priest can he validly consecrate a host no he can't not without a charge by Munoz the authority uh, to do that from the church itself okay very good next up uh, another question in a similar vein dear father Spitzer I was born and raised Catholic I fell away from the church in college a few years later, I met my wife and we started going to her Presbyterian church. I fully consider myself to be a Presbyterian. Does the Catholic Church consider me to be in mortal sin by switching churches, Scotty? Oh, well, Scotty, um, you know, uh, would you be in mortal sin? <clears throat> um, that is such a hard question to ask, be, answer because y you have to have three conditions met. Mm -hmm. in order to commit a mortal sin. You just can't do an act and have a mortal sin. It has to be grave matter, and certainly switching a church is grave matter uh, as far as the, uh, the Catholic Church is concerned. However, you have to do that with sufficient reflection and full mm -hmm. consent of the will. Now, full consent of the will means no impediments to the free use of the will. Mm -hmm. So that is to say, you know, did you... Uh, you know, why did you do this? Well, you were coming back after leaving the church completely. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> you know, um, it, it almost sounds like you were trying to, you know, move closer uh, to Christ from a position of no church to a church. So for me to tell you whether you committed a mortal sin uh, in doing that and now you're in that position with your wife and there's a uh, you know a pressure to stay uh, in that position with your wife what's your free disposition like I do not know mm -hmm. I couldn't possibly know but you know essentially if you really feel that you are uh, basically um, you know have separated yourself from the church uh, without impediment to the free use of your will or that you don't have a pressure to remain mm -hmm. in the state that you are uh, right now contrary to your free will then you you ought to you might want to really consider uh, mm -hmm. um, you know uh, you know discussing this with your wife uh, to see if you want to circle back and come back to the mm -hmm. sacraments and uh, you know maybe seek out uh, a priest for confession but whether you committed a mortal sin or not to be honest, I, I cannot tell you, you alone, and, and of course God himself knows uh, that answer, uh, but uh, the free use of the will is a very important mm -hmm. condition to be met. And oftentimes in a situation like yours, where you have a fallen away, then mm -hmm. you're trying to gradually work your way back to Christ, and then of course now you're in a relationship where there's pressure, mm -hmm. obviously that can, those, there are impediments right. to the free use of the will there. Uh, that may well be there, but if you see those impediments um, being right. released, uh, you know, uh, in your future going forward, you may really consider, right. uh, you know, discussing it with your wife and 
seeing what you want to, uh, you know, if, uh, what you want to do, maybe to come back to the church. Right. But no, the, the Catholic Church couldn't possibly teach that it is a mortal sin because the Catholic Church would never know for an individual penitent um, any more than I would know mm. uh, whether you did that with sufficient knowledge, mm. and it doesn't sound like you had sufficient knowledge at the time, or full consent of the will. Right. But that doesn't <clears throat> mean you couldn't find out more information and, and make a more, yeah. you know, a balanced decision. I mean, and certainly sure. I would advise somebody who's watching the network, as this person must be in some fashion or form, uh, check out the Journey Home program or some of the great programs. Obviously, Marcus Grodi. Oh, yeah, uh, was a absolutely. Presbyterian, and, and as was Scott Hahn, and many others who, who yeah. made you know who, who've kind of looked into it and realized this is the church that Jesus founded, and this is really where mm -hmm. I need to be. Uh, you know, the question is, like yeah. you said, you could have a situation where with a family and a wife, and we're comfortable here, but you know, it, it's something you still need to wrestle with. Oh, yeah, no, I, I think that's very true. Uh, I was just trying to answer the question of whether it was a mortal sin. Right, absolutely. Uh, Plead my ignorance right. to that to that answer. Right. But uh, nevertheless, I, uh, um, I think absolutely, if you feel like if you're watching the, this program, well, maybe you might be thinking that, mm. uh, you know, maybe you and your wife would want to uh, right, move back if you were beginning to understand right. uh, the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, right. which are two things that are not available in the Presbyterian Church. Right. And, you know, that's part of Marcus Grodi's story, too. Right. Uh, you may want to just uh, consider that uh, right. very seriously. Right, and his, his main thing was authority. That was the biggest thing for Marcus, <clears throat> was authority. Yep. Uh, who decides what yep. the scriptures actually mean? Uh, people teaching out of the same scriptures coming up with different conclusions and, and concluded that yep. the, the authority is in the Catholic Church. So, and we have many, many uh, people who aren't Catholic watch the network, and we love it. That's terrific. Mother was incredibly open to that and, and we're all uh, yeah. working and praying for each other but obviously uh, if we didn't think the Catholic truth was the, the whole truth for everybody we wouldn't be sitting here doing this program. So uh, with that said, yeah. uh, right. we got another question mm -hmm. as we come up towards our sure. break. Uh, Dear Father Spitzer, do those who die and are condemned to hell join the demons and try to tempt us away from God? Would I need to worry about an evil relative who died tempting me from the afterlife to follow them to hell? Lauren. <clears throat> well, Lauren, first of all, you don't have to worry about any demon. Mm. So long as you try to remain in the church, you try to, you know, um, you go to confession, uh, you know, when you think you, you've... Uh, uh, you know, committed a mortal sin, and you do that on a somewhat regular mm -hmm. basis. You're going to church on Sundays, and even you know, if you can, to to church at other times, like to mm -hmm. you know, on on a Nash Wednesday or something of that nature. As long as you're trying to do that, um, you know, you're on the path uh, to salvation. The devil really has very little power over you, mm -hmm. and so you don't have to worry about anybody uh, trying to, to to tempt you or pull you down uh, into hell. The main thing, of course, is, you know, can there mm -hmm. be demons who are trying, oh, 24-7, right. uh, the evil spirit's trying to, to tempt you and to pull you into his domain. But if you're staying in the church, trying right. to follow the teachings of Jesus, going to Mass on Sunday, et cetera, right. uh, you know, they're not going to affect you. You don't have to worry. Right. And, um, uh, you know, with respect to him joining the demons, right, right. well, there are a hierarchy of demons, and, you know, Satan's at the top of the line, <clears throat> or if you look at it from C.S. Lewis's mm -hmm. perspective, he's at the very B bottom, bottom of the line, right. in the, 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 the low archy or something, mm -hmm. but uh, anyway, uh, uh, the main thing to, to remember is he's basically, you know, got layers and layers and layers of people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, between him as kind of the authority and uh, the people he controls. So maybe they, they, they are, uh, you know, participating uh, in some of these things, or maybe they're just victimized by it. Mm -hmm. But Catholic Church teaching really doesn't say what happens to human beings who are there um, in, in uh, the domain of darkness where they have freely rejected uh, you know, Christ and, and freely rejected his teaching on love for the rest of their uh, eternity. Right. If that's what they have done and, and they're there, <clears throat> perhaps they do 
uh, right. join in. Perhaps they don't, but the Catholic Church doesn't say. Okay. Okay, I'm going to have a follow-up question when we come back, I want to ask you, but we're out of time. I've got to take a break. Yeah. Much more ahead with Father Spitzer. We'll have that question and much more of your questions for Father Spitzer right after this short break. Stay with us. And thank you so much for staying with us as we continue with Father Spitzer's Universe, answering your questions sent to us through email. And now we turn to Father, and as I mentioned, just as a follow-up, I wanted for my own clarification to understand the idea of, you know, sometimes people would write to us and sometimes, even in general, would think, well, when I die, you know, I go to heaven and become one of the angels, you know, so uh, I'm going to be an angel. Uh -huh. But that's not quite an understanding. So I was wondering, you know, when somebody dies, if, if the demons are made up of the third of the angels who fell in the beginning of time or whatever the mm -hmm. time frame was, to be in, um, mm -hmm. then uh, do, do people who go to hell join that army or cadre, or how does that actually work in your mind? Well, first of all, there's, um, you know, when you go to heaven, you're not going to have angelic power. Okay. You're still going to be a glorified human being, okay. but you're not going to become an angel. Okay. When you go to hell, you're not going to become an angelic uh, spirit, a okay. demon, mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, uh, either. So you, you, you're not you're not going to change your state of being. Um, so the the okay. second thing to remember is, uh, if you join the team, you'd have to join it, uh, as it were, as a human being. Mm -hmm. Do human beings actually do that? Um, you know, I, I'm not sure. The Catholic Church surely does not teach whether they do or whether they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have obviously reported that they saw various people, mm -hmm. but these are all private revelations, so um, you, you can't draw any conclusion from that. Mm -hmm. The one thing you can say is you sure don't want to go there, and whether you, um, <laughs> as a human being, uh, you know, are, participate uh, in tempting people and so forth, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, right. the, Seems like the uh, angelic spirits do a perfectly, um, quote unquote, good. You yeah, know, they need a lot of help, right? Job right. doing it. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't need a lot of help. That's right. There's plenty of screw tapes exactly. and wormwoods running around uh, to <clears throat> take oh, care yes. of everything. That's right. Uh, here's another one, dear Father That's Spitzer. Right. In First Thessalonians, Saint Paul tells us to yeah. pray without ceasing, for it is the will of God. How does someone provide for themselves and their family if they spend have to spend their time constantly in prayer. How can any work get done? Basically, Desmond saying, how can I pray all the time? Yeah, I wouldn't have time to do anything else to actually take care of my family. Yeah, when St. Paul says that, and when he says without ce ceasing, he's, he's not meaning like we're going to go uh, to uh, b before the Blessed Sacrament or, or be in a special state of concentrated prayer, mm -hmm. right, for um, a long period of time uh, where we're not doing any other activity. What he's really talking about is the kind of prayer where we make petitions uh, during the day, and we continuously do this, not like in a you know complete stream that excludes our doing work, but you know like with, I'm working or here I am mm -hmm. sitting on the uh, you know this television program in front of the camera here. Uh, am I um, can I pray while I'm doing? I'm praying mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Lord, you know, give me the insight that I need, uh, even though I'm sitting here saying this on the television. I don't have to take my mind off of one thing and, you know, to, to ask for help, uh, as it were, mm -hmm. um, from the Lord during that time. So I do ask for help uh, during the day. I'm constantly asking for insight during right. the day. I'm constantly offering something up which is very unpleasant during the day. I'm, con you know, and that's all Paul means is that, you know, we, you know, as we're integrating our mm -hmm letting the Lord into our lives, bringing him in right. uh, to help us with his grace, asking him for insight, etc. And it's amazing how fast right. our minds can work, how we can actually turn to him and just say, uh, Lord, help me right now, even though I'm, mm -hmm. you know, on a television program, uh, you know, talking, you know, I can certainly right. have these little prayers 
uh, that I can say. And uh, you don't have to take your mind off of everything. In fact, of course we want to do our work well. Right. But uh, when St. Benedict meant, you know, wor work and prayer, mm -hmm. right, that's what we do here in the monastery, he didn't mean first we do some work and then we do some prayer. Uh, what he meant is first we do some work while praying and then we do some praying, uh, you know, without necessarily working, you know, uh, focusing on uh, being uh, in union with the Lord. Mm -hmm. So um, I think uh, it makes sense. Uh, it's a really good question, though. I can see right. how you would think, oh, that just means you go off by yourself and you don't do any work. But that's not what Paul means. Right. Or the idea that, you know, it's not like you go to church and that's where your prayer life begins and ends. You know, it's something yeah. that you should continue yeah. on in your life. And also, I know because when I start this program, I start praying. Trust me. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Help me, Holy Spirit, understand exactly, exactly what Father Spitzer's point is here because it's very deep <laughs> and I need help. <laughs> Next up. Don't dear, get me guffawing here. <laughs> dear Father Spitzer, <laughs> Matthew 7, 19 says, Every tree which does not produce good fruit shall be cut down and cast into the fire. Does good fruit mean good works as in charity or just trying your best to be a light in the world in general? Dave. Oh, Dave, it's the second one, trying mm. your very best to be light for the world in general. So in other words, what um, Jesus is getting there, good fruit means that you're trying to help people out. Uh, you're trying to, you know, witness to your faith. You're trying <clears throat> to stay away from sin, right? You're, you know, trying to manifest a charity when you can, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not necessarily mounting up uh, all kinds of charitable works, though that uh, uh, certainly is part of it, you know, so, you know, um, uh, if the opportunity presents itself and you have a, a, a possibility of doing something charitable, you certainly, um, you know, would want to do that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you see somebody who is just off by themselves and has no one or is being ignored or someone who uh, really need some help around the office and you reach out to them, uh, that's perfectly good too. But uh, trying to be, a, you know, a light for the world is a really good way of saying it, mm -hmm. that I'm trying to uh, to manifest the, the, the presence of Christ, trying to help people to maintain their faith and, and to do well and so forth. So uh, uh, I think you've got a really good uh, definition right. there, uh, but it's uh, in your second definition rather than uh, trying to mount up... Uh, um, you know, a, a large number of charitable works. Right, right, exactly. <clears throat> uh, next up, dear Father Spitzer, my father was an extremely abusive man to his family. When I became an adult, I was able to finally break all contact with him. He recently died. Outside the family, he presented himself as a wonderful, caring family man. People come up to me and tell me how great he was and how much they admire him. How do I charitably respond to these people while still telling the truth? Sarah. Well, Sarah, <clears throat> what I would probably say is um, something charitable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, now that he's dead and you don't have to forewarn anyone about what he might do to them uh, or, or something. In other words, if you were genuinely fearful that he could abuse another person uh, or abuse uh, somebody that, that uh, uh, you know, was going to be harmed by him, uh, you, you, you know, you definitely would want to hint at something and tell the truth. But if nothing can be gained by that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I would just say, let his name rest in peace. I know that you, you think that uh, I'd love to tell everybody what a, a rat he might have been and how abusive he was. But in point of fact, uh, that truth really will not advance the whole order of salvation. So my thought would be, I would just let it go. Just let it go and just say, you know, um, he really had his very kind moments. Thank mm -hmm. you for saying so. Right. And just leave it at that. And, you know, I, I wouldn't go any further. <clears throat> then they go, well, what do you mean by that? You know, mm -hmm. just, just what I said, that's what I mean by that. Yeah, you just go, yeah, he, he, he definitely was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, unless yeah. somebody, unless yeah. maybe somebody yeah. came to you who had concerns about him and then, 
uh, that was similar to your own, and then obviously you have the ability to say yes. Oh, well, yeah, that would be a that very situation, different situation. You know, well, you know, mm -hmm. I ha have my own issues, but yeah, yeah, like you said, at this point in time, yeah, you know, all you're going to probably do is hurt people. Uh, you know, yeah. So and yeah. that's probably not going to help you. So, exactly. Whether you yeah, it will exactly. or not. Next up, dear Father Spitzer, I came yeah. back to the church in 2016 after being lapsed for 15 years. I went to confession and I couldn't recall the thousands of mortal sins I had committed since my last confession. So I was very general about them. Is this a problem for absolution? And this is anonymous. Something tells me they didn't have well, that anonymous, many mortal no. sins. Yeah, oh. so, they probably didn't have that right. many mortal sins. Well, for sure. Anyway. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, of course, the thousands of mortal sins. Remember, mortal sin requires sufficient reflection, full consent of the will, as well as grave matter. So the main thing, though, is if you tried your best to remember, um, you know, the, the major sins that you have committed, the ones that you regret the most, as you probably know, if you gave that the, your best effort, um, you know, and, you know, truly did not try to skip some sin, sins yeah. that you didn't want to say, as long as you didn't do that, mm -hmm. the absolution absolutely pertains to all of these sins. And when you finish your confession, a, a good way of finishing is just saying, I'm sorry for these and all the sins of my past life. Mm -hmm. And that's just fine. And, um, you know, the absolution covers yeah. those sins, even though you did not specifically mention them. So you don't have to sit there and recall them again and again and again, or suddenly wake up at, you know, three o'clock in the morning and go, oh my gosh, I didn't confess this one. And then there's this other one, mm -hmm. and then just be racked in guilt and scrupulosity for the rest of your right. life. That's not what the purpose of the sacrament is for. It's the opposite purpose of releasing you from those sins according to the merciful love of Christ because you in you are asking trying your best to remember you're in, not trying to culpably forget and you're trying essentially to um, uh, in, you know p doing that uh, do the best of your intention the Lord and you do it with firm purpose of amendment right and you're truly contrite your right. the absolution pertains to every sin right in your past life. Right, and God is merciful, and if you're getting that kind of attack like that, it might be coming from somebody else who's trying to uh, get you back. Yes. Certainly not coming before. from the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Uh, before you weren't exactly. the confession, wants, wants to tell you, really, you're not, a, really, you're really not <laughs> very good. You know, I don't know even what to bother doing that's this That's right. Time, right? Uh, next up, yeah, dear Father, right. right, dear Father Spitzer, I read an article about a 39-year-old woman who was pregnant with her 20th child. She planned to keep having children as long as she could get pregnant. She went on to explain that it is difficult to provide for all the children as an unmarried single mother, but that would not stop her. I know God said to be fruitful and multiply, but isn't it wrong to bring children into the world if you obviously cannot support them? And this is Al. Well, Al, there's two things going on here. First of all, if she's a single woman, yeah. I mean... Uh, the Lord did not say, uh, you know, be fruitful and multiply as a single woman. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that would require some form of promiscuity. So the first thing is, is, is uh, that's not the way to go about it. It's to be joined with your spouse mm -hmm. as one flesh and then uh, to be fruitful and multiply. So that's the first uh, problem there. The second problem uh, is, of course, uh, you know, um, when you say, well, it, if you can't afford them, I, I mean, I think everybody needs to, to, to look, mm -hmm. you know, at, um, you know, what kinds of family and how to, you know, the church says you, you can certainly try to space these things, um, you know, so that you can not only adequately provide uh, for them, uh, but so that, you know, you uh, yourself uh, as a family and uh, can stay together. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, um, you know, use natural family planning for that spacing. Uh, be open in your conjugal acts to, um, to uh, uh, receiving uh, children from God uh, by using uh, NFP. And, um, you know, uh, the number of children, I don't think there is a specific number. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard of 20 before. Uh, right. That's a new one for me. Uh, but I certainly know many people who came from families of 
12 or 13 kids and yeah. gosh they were all great i mm -hmm. i loved those families and you know the older kids are taking care of the younger kids and and uh, you know the idea <clears throat> did they have enough yes they did have right. enough uh, uh to live on because everybody was contributing everybody right. was uh trying to participate and and um in, in terms of just you know, can, um, you know, is the mother responsible and the father responsible for it? No, the older children take care of younger children as well, and mm -hmm. uh, that prepares them. But I, I right. tend to think that uh, those families are very religious, and as religious, they tend to be not only great parents uh, in their lives in the future, they're just great friends. Right. Uh, so I really uh, enjoy being around those people. I just right. think they're very humble, good people. They're never you know, spoiled, they're full of themselves. They've always had to pitch in and help. Right, exactly. And so, it's that uh, self-sacrifice uh, no, uh, that yeah. they learned early on yeah. of caring for others and putting their needs second yep. to others who need their help, right? Whether it's helping mom yep. out or helping their younger siblings out, I would think, right? Absolutely. Right, right. Okay. Next yeah. up. Yeah. And besides, it, it, there's a little bit, when you hear those stories, it sounds like the straw man argument where you come out with this you know, this un bizarre, you know, Ripley's Believe It or Not story, and that becomes the reason why oh, yeah. we yeah. need birth control and uh, controlling, uh, you know, the yeah. population or something, but, you know, so anyway. Well, you know, just uh, now that you mention it in that mm -hmm. book, uh, you know, uh, Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, uh, I present uh, quite a bit of data mm -hmm. uh, that shows the efficacy of NFP and, um, you know, the natural family planning and basically um, not only that, but why it helps in marriage mm -hmm. and why it helps sexual intimacy as well as good emotional marital intimacy, as well as communication within the marriage. Uh, there's just so many reasons. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, uh, you know, the Richard Faring study, which is a really excellent study uh, um, that was carried out, uh, a statistically relevant study, shows that the divorce rate of those who practice NFP um, is significantly lower uh, than those that uh, do um, ABC uh, artificial birth control. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a really good reasons for practicing that and uh, mm -hmm. for being open uh, to uh, uh, to um, you know the children in your marriage. And by the way, right. being open to children and having children generally is the best thing that ever happened to people. Right. I mean, you know, there's nothing like familial love. There's nothing like the love of your child. There's nothing, no loyalty like loyalty uh, to children from parents. There's right. no, you know, love that's better than receiving the love of that little kid who just, you know, uh, uh, you know, not only uh, adores, but uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, wants to be around a good mom and a good dad who are such good examples and who give them their religion, et cetera. So, I mean, if you really look at these studies, they, they really show what a wonderful thing children are. And I think one of the worst propaganda things that has ever been done in the United States is to say that you'll be happier, uh, you know, if you don't have children. Uh, I think this new doc, uh, a study by Dr. Wilcox and right. previous studies by many other excellent people show right. very, very clearly that the people who are open to children, who have strong families, who have strong religion within their families, who have these strong marriages, uh, you know, which involve these children, they're the happiest people around. Do they have to make self-sacrifices? Yes, they do. Do children have tantrums and create stress in, you know, your mm -hmm. life? Yes, mm -hmm. they do. However, all that being said, they're still the happiest people because God gives us the grace to deal with those stresses and God gives us the, you know, uh, the, the ability mm -hmm. to make those self-sacrifices self mm -hmm. willingly out of love, which makes us happy. I mean, that's the whole point. The idea that I'm going to be happier because I don't have to worry about uh, you know, some uh, a child uh, out there. That's just the biggest cultural propaganda ploy that is so utterly false. And all the statistics I give in that book, Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, I'm telling you, mm -hmm. uh, it proves absolutely the contrary. Right. The people that have good, uh, you know, families, even the ones that have difficulties, you know, where there's some difficult children and so forth and there's problems, right. they're still very, very happy individuals and statistically much happier than those who never had any.
Right. What so, are they, uh, in the old can, days, they yeah. used to call them dinks, double income, no kids. That used to be the expression they used to have. Oh, I see. It was very, <laughs> I didn't very even popular. remember that, yeah. Yeah, dink. Uh, so yeah. anyway, here's our next yeah. question. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, I'm a man in my late 30s, and before recently returning to the church, I had a fairly promiscuous past. I'm concerned as to whether my past sexual encounters will affect me or, more importantly, my future wife. I want to avoid negatively affecting her at all costs and would like to know what can I do to prevent that. I respect your incredible insight. would like to know your take on how or if our spirits connect during sexual encounters. Is there a lasting imprint spiritual otherwise made on either person during an encounter? If so, is there any way to remove these past connections so they do not affect us in our future partner, CB? <clears throat> well, um, let me just uh, clarify on two levels. Mm -hmm. First, it, you know, there is a connection, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, Steve, or uh, what, what is it, uh, DB? Yeah, CB, there's obviously yeah. a connection between, uh, yeah, um, there is a connection between uh, uh, promiscuity in the past and having a higher uh, divorce rate within five years. Mm -hmm. uh, that is there, uh, and there's a, you already anticipate the reason that it's there. There are connections that actually do take place. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're kind of, you can't just forget them at will mm -hmm. uh, because sexuality is such a, a powerful co a connector. Mm -hmm. However, uh, if you really want to, you know, mm -hmm. um, be loyal uh, to your wife, which of course you do, other, why else would you be writing in? Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you're, you're doing this because you say, gosh, I really do love her. I do want uh, to establish emotional intimacy with mm -hmm. her. I really do want to give her the time that's necessary, et cetera. So the best way to prevent allowing uh, that promiscuous past from you know putting you into the generalized statistical category of those who are more likely to divorce uh, uh, within five years mm -hmm. the best thing to do is number one practice your faith mm -hmm. go to church follow the teaching of jesus number two give your wife that time consideration and emotional intimacy take the time make the sacrifices to develop that heartfelt emotional strong bonding connection with her involve her in your religious commitment and get you know her to involve you in her religious commitment pray together that absolutely works and strengthens that emotional intimacy which is really crucial to staying together and of course the third thing is uh, when you do have children uh, w with her of course you know involve those children in your commitment of yourself in your commitment of um, your uh, uh, emotional and psychic energy uh, to your kids as well as your spouse bring them all together and of course include the kids in your prayers etc if you do this mm -hmm. you can kind of pull yourself away from that momentum uh, you know from uh, uh, of the past life but there are consequences honestly um, you know uh, in in that past life and they there are relationships that are difficult to forget and of course the mind goes back to these things in stress-filled uh, times etc so you have to be a little bit careful uh, with that past but you you know like I said put your faith in in first place put your wife in first place along mm -hmm. with your faith that reciprocal commitment put the children in there follow the teaching of Jesus you've got a really really good chance of getting a strong emotional bond uh, with your wife and she with you and of course um, when that happens um, you know all you got to do is kind of keep the momentum going don't get distracted mm -hmm. my I think my best advice to you comes from Gabriel Marcel great Catholic philosopher he says, never ask the question whether again, mm -hmm. but only the question how. And I think that is the way to do it. If you start saying whether you should have married this lady that you're uh, thinking of marrying, if you start asking that question, I don't care if it's one year from now, 10 years from now, you start asking that question, all it will do is wreak havoc. You know, you're gonna, um, you know, gonna find yourself um, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about these other people. You're gonna think about the grass is greener on the other side of the right, hill. Yeah, you're gonna yeah. th think of all the defects of this person by comparison with the idealized view that 
that you have of the old relationships. It's all, you know, it's crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. So remember Marcel, never ask the question whether again, but only the question how. Yeah. How are we going to work this out together? How are we going to make this marriage right. work? How are we going to bring our faith into it? How are we going to get to heaven? How are we going to get our kids to heaven? How are we going to get one another to heaven? If you're doing that, you're going to be okay. Right. And your past, you know, it'll be like, you know, um, uh, you know, it'll get more right. and more distant from and, you. And you can't and change it. And less and less power so, over As mother you. would say, live in the present moment. <clears throat> so, and in the present yep. moment, we're out of time. So you need to uh, give us your blessing on the way out the Very door. Very good. And uh, that would be great, yes. Bob. Absolutely. And may Almighty God bless you and send His Holy Spirit down upon you to inspire and guide and protect you so that you might know His true wisdom, know His love, be confident in that love, and find in your trust, in your hope, and in the love that comes from loving the one who loves you the way to eternal salvation and to help others to that salvation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. Be well, and we shall see you next time. And likewise, hopefully you'll join us next time we see Father Spitzer. Don't forget all those books and DVDs of his are available through our EWTM Religious Catalog. There's some great new books. Next week, we'll return to the topic of the moral wisdom of the Catholic Church, which is one of Father's books, of course. And bookmark, don't forget to join me every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time uh, for the latest book interview. Hopefully you'll enjoy those. And Father Spitzer's Universe is available as a podcast on our EWTN Podcast Central page. That's the audio. Go to EWTN.com forward slash radio. Click on the podcast. You can listen to Mother Angelica, Father Spitzer. We have so many new podcasts on there. The, our best and the best of the rest out there. It's all at EWTN Podcast Central. I'm Doug Keck. We'll see you next time. Thanks.